a quick new idea daily from the world's greatest TEDx talks. I'm your host, Atosa Leone, and this is TEDx Shorts. Sitting in a doctor's office, waiting on the results of a medical test, is one of the most nerve-wracking positions we're ever put in. Now, imagine it's your child, and they have a disease that's both rare and unknowable. Peter White was put in a similar situation when one of his children received a diagnosis that was untreatable. But unlike most of us, Peter found himself in a unique position as both a parent and a genomics scientist. Today, he shares the work he and his team have taken on in developing technology to quickly uncover the genetic source of rare diseases so they can help more children. The one language that we all do share in common, regardless of our nationality, is the language of our genome. And our genome represents all of the genetic material or the DNA that we inherit from our parents, one copy from our mom, one copy from our dad. And this genome is made up of a relatively simple alphabet, just four letters that we call bases, which we represent with A, C, G, or T. The challenge with the genome, though, is it's really big. There's over three billion of these letters within our genome. When we change one of these letters, the genes that these letters encode can have drastically different meanings, and that can lead to disease. There's over 7,000 different types of rare disease that we've described to date. And to get that name of rare disease, you have to affect fewer than one in 2,000 individuals. But by no means do I want you to leave here today thinking that rare means insignificant. For us to find the answer, though, for kids with rare diseases, we have to look at the genome. We have to see where that typo has occurred. And to do that, we use a technology called DNA sequencing, which is basically the way that we use to read that code, the order in which those letters appear in our DNA. The first time we attempted to do this with the human genome was the Human Genome Project, which began in 1990. Today, there's new technology that allows us to sequence the genome much faster. And how this technology works is by taking all of that DNA and chopping it into really small fragments of about 300 of those letters, and then performing those sequencing reactions in parallel. And we can do this in parallel sequencing reactions on the surface of a glass slide. Now, the challenge is with the analysis of this data. Because we've chopped the genome up into small pieces, it's much like taking the entire contents of a library and running it through a shredder. But what we have to do is we have to take this shredded material that comes out of the sequencer and assemble it back together so that it looks like our genome. But when we're doing the analysis for a kid with a rare disease, we're not just trying to reassemble it, we're trying to reassemble it and find a typo. So we had to come up with a new way of doing the analysis. And what we did, we came up with an algorithm that very efficiently processed that, piecing that puzzle back together. And this allowed us to take the analysis time down for two, uh, under two hours. How are we using this for kids with rare diseases? Well, I've been very fortunate to lead a program at Nationwide Children's Hospital working with kids with rare diseases to try to use this technology to see if we can identify what's gone wrong in their genome. And that was the case for Lillian Adams' family. For this family, they had been on what we call a diagnostic odyssey. Their journey was a diagnostic odyssey. And by that, what I mean is that when these kids were born, they were identified as having like, low muscle tone. And as they developed, they started to suffer from seizures that couldn't be treated with regular medications. They had severe developmental delays and a host of other issues. And for this family, they went from specialist to specialist, having test after test, trying to identify what was causing their disease. And the result was, in the end, was no diagnosis. Well, for this family, we enrolled them into our study. And five days after completing the whole genome sequencing, we found out what was wrong. Both of the children had inherited one copy of a gene with a typo from dad and one copy of the same gene with a typo from mum. And when you bring these two typos together, it causes a disease called pontocerebellar hyperplasia. Now, for the clinicians, teaching, um, for the clinicians uh, caring for these patients, having this diagnosis is critical in how best to treat and manage them. For our genetic counselors, having a diagnosis means they can counsel the family on their reproductive risks and what risks there may be for other members in the family. 
receiving that diagnosis is life-changing for parents because it puts an end to their search. And I know in my own story with, of facing tragedy and hardship, having someone come alongside me and say, this is not how things were meant to be, or most impactfully to say, you are not alone, has had the biggest impact on me in my recovery from that. And it's the same way with families with rare disease. Once they have that diagnosis, they're no longer alone. The second story I want to tell you about is Emily's story, because Emily exemplifies why it's so important that we are able to do this sequencing rapidly. Emily showed up at the emergency room at Children's when she was three days old, and she was seriously ill. Her blood pH was dangerously low, and she went into a coma. What we found in doing the whole genome sequencing on her was that she had a disease that's known as an inborn error of metabolism. She was unable to metabolize an essential, um, an essential amino acid derivative called carnitine. And for kids with this disease, the outcome is devastating unless they are treated. For Emily, the treatment was simple. It was just replacing the missing metabolite. And then for kids with this disease, they can live a normal and happy life as long as they're diagnosed quickly. So where do I see this technology going? Early diagnosis is critical for early intervention for many kids with rare diseases. What we want to do is perform rapid whole genome sequencing on them and return results back to the clinician in 48 hours. But my hope for the future is in novel therapies for these diseases, with therapies such as gene therapy, which is a new technology that allows us to replace that gene with a typo with a healthy copy of the gene. And that's happening right here today, here in Columbus. Jerry Mendel at Nationwide Children's Hospital spent his career studying a group of diseases called muscular dystrophies. Him and his team developed a new, a new therapy for a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which is a devastating disease that kids with it will lose the ability to walk, move, and eventually breathe. The little girl with spinal muscular atrophy, called Evelyn, received this treatment and she's now able to live a relatively normal life. So my hope is that for these kids, that they will receive a diagnosis, not after eight years, but within days, hope, hopefully while they're still in the hospital when they're first born, and that one day we'll have a novel therapy for all of these diseases. The TEDx talk you just listened to was recorded at a TEDx event in Columbus, Ohio, in 2019. Patient names for Lily, Adam, and Emily have been changed. All TEDx events are independently organized by volunteers who believe in TED's mission of ideas worth spreading. Special thanks to the organizing team at TEDx Columbus. Want to listen to more TEDx talks? Explore the entire archive on the TEDx YouTube channel. I'm Atosa Leone. Thanks for listening and see you tomorrow.